Hi folks, so continuing on the topic of buffer overflows, I'm going to give a very brief overview of how to write Metasploit exploits or exploit development in general. Uh, but um, you're going to get a lot out of actually going through this yourself and working through the practical work of actually developing exploits. But I'm just going to give a brief overview because it might be helpful as a reference. Um, but it follows directly on from the previous video where I was describing basically how buffer overflows work and um, but I'll just give you, show you some, some little code snippets and examples. Apologize, some of the formatting's been lost um, on the way that I've um, generated these slides, but um, hopefully you'll get the idea. So, the, a basic exploit in Metasploit. So Metasploit is a really powerful framework. It, um, it gives us a whole bunch of tools that we can use in the exploit development process itself, and in the exploits that we write, it provides um, a bunch of reusable code and things for us so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of generating shell code per vulnerability and, and all the rest of it. I've recorded topics on Metasploit in the past and hopefully you're all sold on how great it is. Um, however, having said that, you don't have to write exploits in Metasploit. Uh, a lot of the time you can find examples uh, where it's just written in Python or even C where um, really as long as you can feed some input into a program, if you've got the, um, the right input to feed into it, then you know you could write an exploit in any programming language. Metasploit just gives us some convenience functions and things to make life a bit easier for us. So before we even do anything with Metasploit, you see this like there's this kind of metadata at the top of the um, of the Metasploit module that basically allows you to provide information about the, the name of the vulnerability. Uh, the so you would normally like basically name it based on the, what software is vulnerable and what the type of vulnerability it is. And then you write a description of the exploit and where, you know, if you've, um, if someone else discovered the exploit but you're just writing the Metasploit module, then you describe that. Um, and there's also a place to write down the authors there. There's a license. Uh, and what platform it targets, um, and you can be more specific about that as well. So you can um, um, put different different targets, um, like certain versions of software that can successfully be exploited, for example, um, and what kind of sessions are compatible, um, and and all sorts like so references and, and things like that. Um, really, the most important you've got this exploit function, which is where you want to do the stuff that actually exploits the vulnerability. Um, and, you know, so you might start with some boilerplate code like this. It just doesn't do anything yet. You fill it in for the vulnerability that you're trying to write. So say, for example, you're trying to exploit um, some FTP server. You might write the details of that into um, into, a, in, into into the um, Metasploit uh, module code. Describe what target you're developing on. Um, so in this, you know, on my screenshots here, I've got Windows XP. But if you're actually working through this now, you'll be using a different operating system. But um, and then in this exploit um, function, again, apologies for the indenting getting lost here. But you know, so you can do um, it's it's Ruby code, so you can do something like um, puts, which like prints to the screen. Um, and in this case, um, Metasploit provides a bunch of um, things that we can inherit from, which includes um, and things that we can include like um, FTP. And because we've got FTP, we can just do connect. And it will just automatically connect to the using FTP's like user password um, type thing. And um, if you don't specify a username and password, it will connect with an anonymous user. So already we've saved ourselves a few lines of code of having to um, manually specify the user and the password to get that FTP connection connected. And then in order to actually send something, you can use send command. And in this case, we're sending make a directory um, with this. So it's just some Ruby code. We've got the letter A a thousand times. And then we'll disconnect at the end and see what happens. Um, when you run this, depending on the thing that's vulnerable, um, 
if you're using a debugger, you can basically run the vulnerable software in a debugger and watch what happens, what it does. Now, remember what I said in the previous video is if you try and um, if it loads a return pointer, which is not a valid address, and it tries to go somewhere that's not actually allocated memory, the program will crash. And this is what you can see has happened here. Um, and the font's quite small there, but it says access violation when, in, when executing 41414141, which you may recognize as 441 being the hexadecimal representation of the ASCII rex, um, of the ASCII um, for the letter A, capital A. And so 41414141, that is kind of like, this is what we want to see as a bug hunter because uh, we can see that we've actually managed to control EIP. Uh, now the actual task that we, when we do this, we'll be using um, a newer version of Windows and some of these numbers aren't going to work and actually we'll need to like finesse this a little bit, but um, you know, you can get, you can see the, 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 the idea here. So yeah, so you can see. Um, then what you can do is use um, pattern create. So pattern create um, because what we want to know is the exact offset from our input to the EIP. We need to know how long that is. And obviously you could you could try and manually figure that out by entering in strings of whatever you want and trying to decode it. But there's some really great automated tools like what's built into Metasploit is you can use this pattern create tool and you can actually use pattern create and however long you want the pattern to be and send that along instead and then whatever value comes back there, so in this case 69413269, that is the memory, that memory address, which is not pointing at anything real, just tells us where along that pattern um, it managed to overwrite EIP. So now we can identify the offset. So now we know how long we need to be before we can exactly overwrite that EIP value. Um, so now we can um, point EIP wherever we want. We can put any value on that, and as long as we can point it at something that's valid, it will execute it. So we can point it where we want. So if we have control of buffer, um, you know, we could put a shell code on the buffer. Um, and so um, there, you know, there are newer mitigations that might make that harder, but let's say for the sake of argument, when we're trying to understand the concepts here, we can put our shellcode directly onto the buffer and then um, overwrite the EIP. Um, so, you know, you can put the buffer, you put the shellcode either before or after that offset. So what you really need to do normally is you test how long, you know, how much space did you get before you hit the EIP? Is that enough space to put some shellcode? Or after EIP, uh, how far can you write before things start to break in that direction? And then you can decide where you're going to put your shellcode. Do you want to put it before or after where your offset is to put your EIP value, to put whatever's going to end up being an EIP? Um, and now, now you need some way of getting EIP, giving EIP some value that's going to jump you to where you sh your shellcode is. So the way you could do that um, simple way of sort of visualizing it is to write a bunch of A's. So you do a whole bunch of A's to the length of the offset and then do one set of B's to exactly overwrite EIP um, and then write a whole bunch of C's. And then if you know the ASCII representation, it'll be 41's, 4, four ones for A, for 2 for B and for C, for, for 3 for C. Um, and so you'll be able to see um, kind of where you are at, and then if you also, um, you know, you can double check that our um, EIP got overwritten by 42s, four twos, so that's the B, that's that's what we wanted, and then you can look and see, well, how much space is there on either side of it, and, and is there a way we can jump into it? Um, one way you can do it is if you happen to have um, one of your registers happens to point into one of those in, um, into your buffer somewhere, then that's a good candidate for putting your shellcode there. So in this case, we've got ESP pointing into the Cs. Um, and 
Again, depending on the platform that you're developing the vulnerability of the exploit for and a whole bunch of other stuff, you might find that you need to put your put it before or afterwards. But in this case, you can see uh, that ESP is pointing in the C's and you could run that program a few times and check that it is always going to point into the C's. Um, in an ideal world, we might hope that we could just directly take, say for example, this value uh, and just and just hard code that as the place we want to jump. Unfortunately, we can't do that because um, the stack does move every time. Even if we ignore some newer mitigations like address space layout, randomization and stuff, ASLR and stuff like that, the stack is going to be a little bit different each time the program runs. And so we can't just jump to the exact stack address. Instead, we need to find some way to get there. So we, if we find that we've got a register that points where we want to go, now we need to find an instruction that tells the um, CPU to jump to where um, ESP is pointing. So, so yeah, if we put our payload in the buffer, um, we can't just simply overwrite EOP with the address of our payload. So for example, this. Um, so the exact size of the stack might be slightly different um, to control flow. So um, we need some way. One way is to find a register that points in the buffer, which is what I just said. Um, in this case, both ESP and EDI are pointing somewhere into our buffer. Um, in this case, after EIP. Um, and so what we would normally do is we put some NOPs. So, so NOP is a no operation instruction for the CPU. It just does nothing. And it's an easier way to target to write the um, attack because we just put a bunch of NOPs and then our shell code. So we just have to land somewhere in the NOPs. Uh, so NOPs and then the payload and the point that E, because also because the stack's moving around slightly, it can provide a little bit of buffer for things to, to work out as well. Um, and then we point our AP at some existing code that jumps to the register. So what we do is we um, search through the shared code in, that, in the program for a jump ESP instruction. Um, so it's better to use either the executable itself or a DLL or shared object or whatever that sh ships with the vulnerable program rather than one that ships with Windows because ev for every version of Windows, um, they'll be in different locations. So then what we need to send is um, some A's or just some junk uh, for the length of the offset. Then the return address in little endian, so we have to like write it backwards, but it's just to do with the way that things are ordered in, in address, in, um, um, in RAM. Um, and then we include a bunch of NOPs. Um, in this case, this, you know, just a small amount of NOPs, 30 characters, for example, uh, 30 instructions, characters. Um, and then we have our payload, which what we can do if we're using Metasploit is we can just do payload.encoded and it will do its magic and you can um, then mix and match and drop in payloads and things. Um, we also need to specify bad characters um, and so there's certain things that if our shell code includes those things, it will stop working. So the obvious one is, you know, we said before that if you do the end of um, file character, or the um, or at the end of a or a new line character like a null byte, which says that means like the end of the string. Those things are going to stop it from working because, um, as well, especially if it's coming before the EFP value, because um, it will stop all the stuff to get read into the program, all of, to write over at the buffer. So as a starting point. It's pretty much always safe to assume these three um, values are um, like the null byte um, and um, and these two are bad characters, <clears throat> but then you might need to add, add additional ones. But as a minimum, you can add these ones. Um, the you can discover more by um, by testing for them by testing the way that the program um, what ends up being in memory after you input. Of all the characters, uh, but basically, you know, there are ways you can do that. But if you specify what bad characters there are, and then you can also tell Metasploit how to how to basically try and keep the server running 
when the um, the function ends because um, we we basically you know want to stop the um, program from crashing so there are different ways you can basically tell it to uh, to deal with that because um, you don't want to take down the server while you um, exploit the vulnerability for example so as a finishing touch we can um, move some of the things that we've kind of hard coded like the offsets and the return addresses into target specific details because then if we imp improve our exploit by adding targets for different operating systems and things we can um, just update it in that one place uh, and the rest of the exploit can stay the same um, and we also want to figure out what the maximum space there is for the payload and you can tell uh, it can add that in as well um, and uh, it's what I was saying there about testing for bad characters so that's um, that's basically a um, crash course in the um, simplest kind of buffer overflow um, that is realistic um, which is where we um, we're assuming we don't have address um, space layout randomization which moves things around um, we'll talk about those um, later in another topic uh, and other mitigations and ways you can work around them but this is a good really strong starting point and there are some real exploits that you can write this way um, and it's like the equivalent equivalent of writing an exploit for Windows XP and the level of security that was present in Windows XP there's some extra stuff that's now available now um, often but not always present and when I say not always is a lot of programs still get compiled with layout randomization disabled which means that you can do this exact approach to write the exploit uh, you know using all these same steps essentially and if layout randomization is enabled it might be partially enabled which means that some parts of the system might have ASLR in, in, enabled while others aren't and so then it's just when you do that step where we looked for that jump ESP instruction we want to make sure we're finding that in a part of the program that doesn't have layout randomization which is where it changes where it loads into RAM because um, obviously if you're trying to jump to a specific point it's a lot easier if it's in the same place every time um, and so you um, yeah, you can look at, um, there are ways you can basically list the parts of the um, mapped memory uh, and find the bits that aren't moving and use that. And even with Windows, when ASLR is enabled, it actually only randomizes every time you reboot the machine. So it's still possible in some cases that you can basically do this exact same steps that we've just followed now and it will still work uh, to write an exploit that will work until the machine gets restarted. So it could still have its use cases. Um, but yeah, we'll come back to that in more detail when we're on the topic of mitigations. So I hope you find that interesting. I think it is uh, quite interesting um, to, to see you know, how to go about writing uh, an exploit. And obviously, it's also a lot of fun to do. So I hope you enjoy putting this stuff into practice.